Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I, um, uh, we're so fortunate to have Sam Glick come this afternoon again for part two. So uh, for those of you who missed uh, his first talk last week, uh, we do have the recording of that and it's on our website. You can check that out at our website, rosemaninstitute.org. And, but before we start, I know you're eager to hear uh, Sam's talk today, but I'd like to share with you that the 2021 Rosamond Innovator application is open and the deadline to apply is April 12th. So selected companies will receive communication coaching and business strategy advices from our executive advisors. They will also receive in-kind services from our service partners and have the opportunity to present to our network of investors. So if you are a startup or know someone who can benefit from this program, do apply or tell them to apply. Uh, you can go, uh, all the information is, again, is in our website at rosemaninstitute.org. I also like to let you know that we have our weekly podcast where we share stories and also insight from thought leaders with you. The podcast is geared for health tech entrepreneurs who want to build a successful company. And our guests range from top founders, uh, investors, and key opinion leaders. So do check them out at your favorite podcast app. We are on all platform. And so you can find everything in our website. So there you go. So now let's get into why we are all here. Uh, we are here to hear Sam. So I'm so honored to have Sam join us again this afternoon. Uh, so I think, um, again, if you missed his talk, I think this talk can be a standalone because this talk he's going to focus on the provider side. Last week was about the payer side. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Sam. Sam is an economist by training and high tech entrepreneur by background. He's a partner at Oliver Wyman, where he leads the Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Center. Previously, Sam was in a high tech strategy practice at Accenture. And prior to that, he led strategy and corporate development activities at Mercer. He also spent six years as the founder and chief executive of Algebra Online, a web-based educational service business. Sam also served as a member of our advisory board here at UCSF Rosemont Institute. We're so lucky to have him and the Meals on Wheels of San Francisco Honorary Board. So, and what today Sam will share with you his insight based on his experience, observation and interaction with all healthcare stakeholder. And as you know, Sam has worked with leading providers, health plans, biotech manufacturers, employers, enablement companies, retailer, and venture capital firms, so it's like everything in healthcare space. He worked with their senior executive to, uh, to create the infrastructure required to serve consumers successfully. So as you remember from last week, Sam will take questions from all of you. Uh, please send your question in the Q&A section and he will answer those questions along the way. And last week, Sam answered more than 60 questions and I think even more from the audience. So send your question away. And with that, Sam, please take it away. Thanks, Christine. And I am uh, really happy to be with everybody here again today. Um, so apologies to everybody for the delayed start. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical challenge, which is why you see me looking like I am in a dark room. I swear I have not entered witness protection program. Uh, I am <laughs> just on a different camera uh, since my other one gave out right before we started here. Uh, but happy to be with everybody again today. Um, really, I thought last time had such a robust set of questions and um, got, you know, I, hopefully it was useful to all of you. I, I got a lot of insight into, um, into where innovation is really headed uh, and what everybody here in the audience is working on. And it brings me, you know, kind of great joy and hope uh, to see how this community trying to transform healthcare in the way it is, because uh, it's the only way things are going to change. And goodness knows the system needs it. Um, with that, many of you emailed me uh, after the last session. Uh, I got to some of those, not to all of them. Uh, if you emailed me after the last session and I haven't gotten back to you, uh, it's nothing personal and I haven't forgotten. I'll catch up on the rest of them over the next couple of days. Uh, so if you haven't heard back, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, similarly, um, I encourage you to put the questions in the chat. That way, everybody can benefit from the answers as we go through. Um, but if you have questions or other thoughts that you want to share, by email, more than welcome those. Uh, I've put my uh, email in the chat, but it's just sam.glick at oliverwyman.com. 
Um, last time we talked about the system overall uh, and then focused on the payer, the health insurer part of the system. Uh, today, we're gonna focus on, as Christine said, the healthcare provider part of the system. Uh, it's the largest part of the system. It's the most fragmented part of the system. It's where the vast majority of the dollars go. Uh, and in many ways, it is the part of the system that is still maturing the most. Healthcare providers in the US, and again, our focus is on the US, uh, healthcare providers in the US really have been community businesses and started uh, as community charities and kind of cottage industries. Uh, and they have grown up dramatically with healthcare cost inflation over the past few decades. But in many ways, the structure retains that kind of community orientation, that kind of not-for-profit um, decision-making kind of orientation um, that has led to a lot of inefficiency and a lot of opportunity. Uh, so we'll talk about what some of that opportunity is today. Um, I'll share a few pages here. As Christine and Erminio mentioned, I'm happy to share. Um, will, the recordings are available online. This session will be recorded and available as well. Uh, and uh, Christine and Erminio uh, will get you both decks if anybody wants to share those, see those as well. Happy to distribute those to anybody who'd like them. So uh, you don't have to worry about taking screenshots or furiously taking notes. Uh, if you miss something, happy to get you the materials. So with that, um, let's dig in. And uh, one of my colleagues, Rachel Zeldin, who actually did a Rosenman session like this too, uh, created this slide. Um, but being a provider is a rough business right now. Uh, you know, what are the biggest challenges? Well, they've had COVID. We think COVID cost uh, providers in the US uh, probably around $200 billion uh, from the lack of volume that came through. New virtual competitors, many people probably saw the Amazon announcement this week uh, and the announcement of Doctors on Demand merging with Grand Rounds, just a really hot space there in virtual care. Um, angry doctors, uh, physicians are in many ways like faculty uh, or any other profession like consulting or lawyers or anybody else. Uh, they got into it uh, not because they wanted to be managed, but because they wanted to help people. And as those groups get bigger and bigger, it's more and more of a challenge. Sudden payer mix shift. Um, the economics in the provider business are really a kind of Robin Hood game. And I'll talk about that in a second. It's a rough time to be a healthcare provider. Uh, and so as we think about the challenges they're facing, and as the companies represented here on Zoom, think about the challenges uh, that you're trying to help your customers or your potential customers exist or address, put yourself in the context of the world in which they exist. Uh, think about uh, the challenges that they're facing, what's really primary for them, what's existential for them, and how can you be part of the solution for that? As we think about the last couple of years, um, really those forces are, th there are three of those forces that are, um, that health systems are facing. Um, the first is a shrinking commercial population. And the, the most fundamental element of health system economics is to think about the massive cross subsidy that underpins the health system business model. So in the US, at a typical health system, and obviously there's variation in this, um, those who come in with employer-sponsored insurance, commercially sponsored insurance, are all the profit and then some at most systems. In many cases, they represent somewhere between 30 and 40% of the volume. They can represent two thirds of the revenue in some cases, uh, and they represent three to 500% of the profit in many cases. All of that margin coming from the commercial population is being used to subsidize Medicare, Medicaid, and the uninsured, as well as all sorts of, of other overhead costs that the hospitals have. So you say, well, why wouldn't I just get into the commercial business alone? Well, that's not enough to keep a system full. And so the conventional wisdom is that the business model of, of healthcare provision is that the commercial patients pay the bills, the Medicare patients, which represent the biggest share of volume, keep your beds full. They let you amortize your fixed costs, the hospitals you own uh, and the people you employ. And then Medicaid and the uninsured let you serve your mission as a not-for-profit, right? So you're taking all the money from the commercially insured, you're, keep, you're amortizing your fixed costs off Medicare and you're using Medicaid to serve your mission. And that's a model that works pretty well as long as those segments remain in the appropriate balance. But the challenge we have in the US right now with that business model is that it is immensely fragile and subject to demographics and disruption. Demographics in that as the population ages, and in the US ages faster than it's growing, um, what that means is more people are turning 65 than are coming on to commercial coverage 
every year in most parts of the country. And so you have a lot of people going from that place that pays the bills to that place that just keeps your bed full um, without fundamentally changing who they are. And that affects that massive cross-subsidy business. The other thing is that it's a cross-subsidy business like this um, is very um, vulnerable to disruption. Uh, a player can come in and say, I'm just going to target the commercial population and I'm going to chip away at a couple of percentage points of share in a market. And it can have a huge impact on health systems. Uh, I often get asked by health system CEOs, well, who do you think my biggest competitor is or who should I be most worried about? You know, is it the other system in town? Is it Optum? Is it uh, some sort of virtual care? Is it Amazon? And I reliably will tell them it's not any one competitor. It's 10 or 20 innovators, new companies who are going to come in and take away two or 3% of share, but two or 3% of the very valuable share, two or 3% of that commercially insured segment, or maybe that Medicare Advantage segment where you can perform in value. Uh, and they'll leave the fee-for-service Medicare, they'll leave the Medicaid, they'll leave the uninsured. And that's, that's the threat they face. The other piece is um, hospital system pressure in general. You know, even without the demographic shifts, uh, the other cross subsidy that was going on was among service lines. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that in most systems, there's a handful of service lines. Maybe it's oncology or pharmacy or ortho or cardio or something else that represent all of the profit and then some. And it's subsidizing everything else. And you have the kind of classic business school department store problem. Uh, where if you've got a bunch of loss uh, making service lines and a few highly profitable ones and somebody comes in and does just the highly profitable stuff, you're in trouble. Right? You can't be all things to all people forever. You can't be Sears Roebuck uh, or you're going to go under. On top of that, there's pressure to take care of all those people coming through differently. Um, CMS is clamping down on readmissions through pay for performance programs. Um, external care New types of facilities may keep people out of the hospital altogether. And then on top of that, COVID pressure. Uh, COVID in the recession accelerates people away from the commercial. Uh, we're seeing, we saw a big drop in elective procedures, and now we're seeing a big increase in demands for care and compounded access. Uh, so all sorts of challenges going on. If you kind of put this all together and say, what do the last few years really mean for the industry? It's a, it's a tough, tough um, environment in which to operate. Uh, health systems across the board in 2020 were hit pretty hard, uh, particularly those that were very high share fee for service. Uh, those who were more fee for value, who took more risk, who weren't as vulnerable uh, to the downturn in elective procedures did better, um, but it's hard. And we're gonna have the double whammy coming this year and beyond of not just that loss of elective procedures, uh, but as people come off commercial coverage, uh, also the loss of that commercial revenue. Uh, and we've just saw, seen the beginning of that. There's a lag following increases in unemployment um, it, because people go on COBRA and they retain coverage for a while. But as they come off COBRA and they move on to government pay, they get hit even harder. The for-profits like HCA and Tenant and others will do a little better. Uh, they're more strategic about where they put their facilities in terms of payer mix. Uh, and they are much more likely, uh, they're more aggressive about payer mix management in many cases. Um, Independent provider groups are in a tough spot. Uh, before the pandemic in 2020, uh, the typical independent physician group um, had less than four weeks of cash on hand, very different than big hospital systems. Many of them went under, decided just not to continue uh, with the pressure or sold elsewhere. The ones that are left seem to be stabilizing, um, but um, it's, it's a tough go. Virtual care, uh, man, to be in the virtual care business over the last 18 months or to be an investor was a very good time. Uh, but uh, I did a, a little Google search and spent a couple hours looking. I stand here at home in San Francisco and I have more than 250 options uh, to go for a virtual visit. I can go to one of the big pure plays. I can go to any health system in California where somebody is licensed. I can go to one medical. I can go to CVS. I can uh, go to uh, any number of places provided by my employer, by my payer, by my uh, health system. And that quickly, the video visit, the talking to somebody on a screen like you and I are doing right here becomes a commodity. And those that are gonna differentiate uh, will need to differentiate beyond that to think about continuous engagement and remote monitoring and integrating with physical and home care and all the things that are gonna help them stand apart. 
The rest of the industry we talked about the other day, chain drug had a nice bump as an essential merchant. They're gonna gain from the vaccine and from testing, uh, but those stores are still too big and they're having to pivot to digital. Uh, the blues and the national health plans are really the inverse of the provider story in 2020, uh, in that as elective procedures dropped off, volume dropped off, uh, the blues, uh, their medical loss went down, they made more money. Um, but in 2021, they're gonna pay more and the commercial business is dropping. The nationals tend to do better. They're a little more diversified. They do better in government pay, um, but it's still a rough go. Health IT spending is capital spending. Um, a lot of that comes from providers. Payer health IT spending seems to be in better shape, um, but health IT is a big chunk of capital budgets, and so we got to watch that. And for those thinking about provider enablement, um, you're competing for a smaller and smaller pie, at least as cost cutting continues. Pharma remains the dice game that it is, uh, and med device tends to follow surgery. So a little bit, let me get a little bit clearer about you know, that kind of provider business model. And this is what I was talking about at the outset. This is uh, an actual, uh, I would say a pretty average community health system in the US. Uh, this is a stylized version of their actual economics with just enough specifics uh, removed to protect the innocent. Um, but this is what their business actually looked like. When you look at their actual cost of different segments, the commercial fee-for-service business, about 170% of cost was covered by revenue. Commercial risk was a little bit lower than that. When systems move to risk, it is often a total cost takeout play by the payers, uh, ultimately. And then they lose money on Medicare fee-for-service, on Medicare Advantage, and Medicaid, um, covering uh, as little with Medicaid uh, as uh, just under 40% of their costs with the revenue. This is a tough business to be in. This is really hard. And so when innovators like the ones here on the phone, you think about, well, what's my story? Well, my story either has to be, I'm gonna help you attract more of the patients on the left. I'm gonna help you get more than your fair share of commercial patients. You're gonna have the best primary care, the best experience, the best targeting, the best location strategy, the best virtual care, the best performance in uh, service lines that really matter to commercial patients like oncology and maternity and others. Or I'm on the right and I'm gonna help you reduce the cost of care in your fee-for-service fee -for -service businesses. I'm gonna help you be more efficient with Medicare patients, I'm gonna help reduce readmissions. With Medicaid, I might help you with better targeting and care management. Or I'm gonna help you perform in Medicare Advantage risk, as we talked about last time. I'm gonna help you with everything from the kind of mechanics of it to coding and document, like coding and documentation, to population health models, uh, to how you manage your risk contracts, to maybe even being a plan yourself. But when I think about the kind of core value propositions to a system, those are the three. I'm helping you on the left of this, uh, become, become the provider of choice, get more than your fair share of commercial business, even though that's a pie that isn't growing as fast as the rest. I'm gonna help you in the fee-for-service business on the right, which means help you reduce unit costs and keep people from coming back when they don't need to, or I'm gonna help you perform in value. Uh, and whether there's, that's the mechanics of it, like risk adjustment and coding, or the care management pieces of it, like pop health. Right? So I challenge this group, think about what is your solution if you're selling it to a provider? Right? Which one of those three big categories do you think and do you think you fit into? How do you fit into their big strategic challenges? Oh, let me keep going here. I mentioned the cross subsidy piece. Uh, this is a fun kind of little graphic that we uh, drew. This is completely illustrative, but let's take just the hospital piece of the provider business to start. Uh, not the full system. I'll talk about the system piece in a minute as you bring in physicians. Uh, but when we look at their business, um, where do they make money? They make money on surgical and procedural businesses, service lines, on radiology. The emergency department typically is a loss leader, um, but it's where in some cases nearly a third of inpatients start. So you've got to have them in the right places, be accessible to the right populations. Outpatient depends on the service line and administrative costs obviously uh, are high and growing, um, but don't contribute to revenue. And this map, this kind of illustrative map is important to keep in mind because I'm either helping to reduce the costs of the things that don't bring in money for a fee-for-service system, or I'm helping to bring in volume or improve the reputation or quality for those things that do.
So what is the industry that we're dealing with? Uh, I mentioned last time that the vast majority of hospitals are in the US are not for profit. Um, and you can see that here. Uh, when you look at it, um, by number of hospitals, um, on the left-hand side, uh, it's just a little under 50% are not-for-profit, uh, another over 20% or so are government, uh, and then the for-profits are a little more than a quarter. Um, if you look at it by beds, uh, it actually skews a little bit more not-for-profit and government, um, and uh, same by revenue. But what we're basically talking about, the kind of rule of thumb, is an industry in which roughly 80% of the business goes through not-for-profits and government, roughly 20% of the business goes through for-profits. Uh, and those not-for-profits in particular um, have you know, this very kind of balanced scorecard approach to management. Um, they obviously need to maintain financial sustainability and bring in, um, bring in the right amount of revenue and margin. They um, have both legal and ethical commitments to their communities. Uh, to do things like provide emergency care and care for Medicaid and charity care for the uninsured. Um, and they have reputations as community employers and roles to play in that. Uh, as I mentioned in our last session, uh, hospitals in many towns are the largest employer in the town, or at least the largest private employer, which really makes it difficult for them to cut costs. Dave Brown, uh, Dave, you're one of the emails I owe you a response to, I haven't forgotten. Uh, but Dave Brown says, wow, with all the threats emerging as a result of innovative delivery models, e.g. Amazon, why are hospitals so resistant to innovation? They still rely so heavily on Epic or Cerner to give them advantages, blocking so many of us who can supplement Epic or Cerner with extra value and additional efficiency. Let me, I'll split that question into two and it's related to this. Um, I would say intellectually, hospitals are not actually resistant to innovation. If you have a conversation with a health system executive, they'll tell you they know these threats are coming. Uh, the kind of conversation we're having today is the kind that's had in every board education session uh, or every executive team meeting uh, for a health system across the country. Um, but they have structures um, that make it very hard to let go of the current model. Um, but they have big labor intensive models which drive 50 to 60% of the costs, and it's hard to get rid of the labor. Uh, as I mentioned, they tend to have community not-for-profit boards. So the kind of microeconomics of disruption, uh, the idea that uh, they're afraid of somebody coming in and buying them or um, maybe uh, doing a hostile takeover, that doesn't happen in the not-for-profit world. And they don't have boards pushing in the same way uh, that you do. And, and they tend to be conservative cultures. Um, you know, there are still uh, a culture of you know, kind of first do no harm in healthcare. Uh, and um, that makes it um, a very conservative culture in most health systems in terms of evaluating solutions for their quality, for their impact on patients, for privacy, for IT security, for whatever it might be. Um, and so that's where you see all sorts of different approaches inside systems to solving that. Some have created big innovation arms, some have set aside percentages of their budgets, some are still trying to figure it out. Um, but um, this is going to be a big evolution that we'll see. And um, I don't think it's going to be evenly distributed. You know, kind of personal prediction is that if you go to most uh, cities and towns across the U.S., at least kind of mid-size and large ones, um, they are um, two or three health system towns. Um, it's not going to be evenly distributed. The odds are we will see one go under in many of those cities and towns. They won't be able to support the business model that we've we thought it's gonna be a rough go uh, moving forward for those that don't innovate. Um, Dave, to the second part of your question, they rely so heavily on Epic or Cerner to give them advantages. The, you know, that was, that was the big sales pitch and we could have a whole different session on the rollout of EMRs in the US uh, and whether meaningful use was ultimately a good thing or a bad thing and the incentives that were provided. Um, but fundamentally these systems um, were sold to health systems for um, huge price tags. Um, there's plenty of systems that spent over a billion dollars to put them in. Um, they were massively disruptive to workflows. They designed workflows around them. Um, and they sit at the core of the system now. They are their billing system. They are their clinical workflow system. Uh, and unscrewing them, you know, taking them out of that system is a huge, huge challenge for them. Um, you know, we've probably never seen anything quite like it. I think the closest... Uh, probably be ERP replacement or core banking replacement in financial services. Um, it'll happen, 
uh, you know, if, if the uh, analogs have told us anything, um, you know, ERP is slowly are moving to the cloud, um, HRS slowly moved to the cloud, but it takes a long time. It's a once every 10 years kind of upgrade cycle, uh, not to do it right away. Um, and that's why they're trying to squeeze as much as they can out of that Epic or Cerner investment for better or for worse. Divya, um, how much of that hospital system's lack of innovation is based on concern for IT risk? How do you mitigate this and convince them of your security? There's definitely a lot of IT risk concern within healthcare. Um, I would say um, it's significant. And it, you know, obviously it depends on the system, but it's significant. Um, the level of scrutiny that they'll put on their IT systems is quite high. Um, I'd say the only thing higher than that is actually probably privacy risk. Uh, health systems have been held liable for all sorts of privacy breaches and have an almost kind of HIPAA paranoia, even about things that, that don't necessarily fall under HIPAA. Um, and that's worth keeping in mind. Um, you know, I, in terms of how do you mitigate that and convince them of your security, um, you know, the first, it's got to start with a conversation and it's got to start at the outset. Um, you know, the thing I have seen a lot of um, smaller players do um, is get really excited based on a conversation they've had with the innovation team or with a particularly particular physician team, and even maybe get a business buyer really excited about something. Uh, and then they wait for the last step to go through the IT security assessment. And that IT security assessment takes three to six months and they might fail it, uh, or they might be required to do things that they just don't have the money to do. And so being very upfront with your early customers about what their IT security requirements might be, talking to them about how you mitigate those, uh, and then making sure you have a very strong business champion. You know, the innovation group is great or a clinical leader is great, uh, but ultimately you need somebody who can be a peer of the CIO and say, let's figure out how to make this work. Uh, and that's gonna come from a PL leader inside the organization. Brian, uh, what differs between the three charts? Uh, no, it's the same year. And uh, the left-hand side is number of hospitals. The mid middle one is number of beds. And the third one is revenue. Divya, uh, what is the best way to integrate your system with Epic and Cerner? They are highly protective. Um, the short answer to that is yes, they are. And it's not easy to do. Um, they do both have some partner programs. Um, but the, the surest way to get them to open up is to have for them to have a customer who's demanding it. You know, you going to them as a vendor and saying, I want to integrate in the absence of a customer install, it's pretty hard. Um, when I have seen them move is when they have a big system customer who says, I want to use this, make this work. And so going to them with a customer, even if it's a pilot customer, can be a lot more effective. All right. We got a couple more questions, but I will I will save them uh, for a few slides from now for when they're relevant, because um, we got a couple of pieces here. All right, so if we keep chugging, we think about those economics and that distribution of hospitals. Well, how do they actually get paid? Um, and this is a massively simplified view of how they get paid. Um, but the left-hand side is the traditional volume-based model. Um, and it is the dominant model still in the US today for all the talk of value-based payments. Uh, they're growing, they're growing slowly. Um, still most payments to health systems are volume-based. And you can really think of them in three ways. The most common is kind of discounted fee-for-service reimbursement. That's how most commercial insurers pay. Uh, we talked last time about how the rate card, uh, the kind of rack rate set of hospitals um, are numbers that almost nobody pays. What they really pay is discounted fee-for-service. So I go in with my Blue Cross of wherever's or my Aetna or United or Cigna or Humana card. Um, and um, uh, the my payer has negotiated a rate, they pay for the volume, uh, and that's gonna be a whole stack of things. It's gonna be my visit, my hospital stay, any tests that are run, meds I got, imaging studies, procedures that happened, whatever it is, it gets added up. There's a discount that my payer has negotiated. Uh, and the way you win that if you're a hospital is bring in as much volume as possible. Just keep bringing it in and, um, and getting reimbursed for those things. Medicare has mostly moved uh, in the middle to this kind of diagnosis related, related group, so-called DRG payment. Uh, and that's based on a diagnosis, based on what somebody came in for, not necessarily all the things we did to them. And so I might come in for a uh, DRG 470 
uh, hip or uncomplicated hip or knee replacement. And regardless of how many nights I stay or how much uh, medication I require or how many x-rays they do, I'm gonna get a fixed case rate for that from uh, Medicare and some commercial payers. Um, what that means is that the optimization game for hospitals in that business is first making sure you're getting paid for the highest relevant uh, diagnosis related group. Was that hip or knee replacement really uncomplicated? Or can I get paid more if there were complications with it? Uh, and then it's optimizing the factory, right? Once you're getting that kind of fixed price, somebody come in, you get paid for it. And then the third used by both commercial and government payers is per diem, pay per night. And you'll see this uh, often for things like ICU stays uh, or kind of med surge beds that don't necessarily have a procedure associated with the diagnosis related group. Um, this is like being a very expensive hotel, right? You have a rate, a negotiated rate, it covers all the services. Um, and so the per diem reimbursement game, if you're optimizing revenue as a hospital, is again, reduce the unit costs best you can, uh, only deliver necessary care and deliver it at an affordable price, uh, and then better manage the patient experience inside the hospital so the patients want to stay with you. Uh, so they're not demanding to go home as quickly as possible. Value-based, I wanna talk about separately, uh, but we're probably seeing kind of in true um, and sort of true tied to outcomes, right? Not just kind of pay for performance, uh, but really tied to outcomes, probably 12 to 15% of payments running through this model. Um, it's growing, it's growing slowly, um, mostly driven by um, the federal government. All right. I will. Um, Anthony Girardi, a little plug. Uh, Dave and Divya, you were asking about how to get integrated with Epic and Cerner. And uh, Anthony has kindly offered uh, to connect to you. So I will, uh, I'll send you a little chat with his info, um, but he can help with integration. All right. Oh, hold on. All right, so what about the risk portion? So when we think about risk, risk can mean almost anything. And there's a big talk about moving to risk. What does that mean? Well, the things on the left-hand side of the prior chart, um, fee-for-service, right? That's based on utilization. When we think about risk, there's a spectrum. Many are kind of in a gain share agreement um, where there's nothing to be had but upside, there's still fee-for-service. So this might be an agreement where you say, I'm gonna take care of people with diabetes. And if I improve their HbA1c by a certain amount, I get a bonus. Um, that's often how providers kind of tiptoe into taking risk. Um, they'll then move into risk share, so-called upside downside risk. Uh, this is quite common, um, but you set a benchmark. Uh, Fee-for-service payments are provided at the benchmark. It may be that you get paid at 90% uh, of the uh, expected payment. And then you either don't get the rest of it if you don't perform, or you may be able to go up to 110%, right? Think about it kind of being in a corridor. This is where they really start to get interested in, in managing that cost. And then capitation is the ultimate in risk. It says you pay me a fixed fee uh, to take care of somebody. The healthier they are, the less care they require, uh, and therefore uh, the more margin I can make on that. The trick with doing all of this is, um, Systems have been slow to move into it. Um, and obviously this is an estimate, but when I think about the health systems in the US, yeah, there's probably a core 15% or so who are hardcore committed to fee-for-service. They're running the old game, the old game still works in their market. Uh, they either don't have a lot of competition or they don't have a payer pressuring them to move to value. Uh, they probably have a pretty good commercial mix uh, and they're sticking to it. Most systems today are piloting value. Um, they're, you know, I'd say probably 60% of them, something like that. They've got a few arrangements. They're in a Medicare ACO. They might have a partnered product with a health plan. They might be in some pay for performance or upside downside programs for a few health plan products. But it is in a small portion of their population. It's a controllable amount of risk on their revenue. Um, and it's something they're doing in order to learn to perform in value, but it is not the biggest piece of their, um, their revenue stream. Their revenue stream is still predominantly fee-for-service, and that's most places. And there, is probably, there are probably 20% that have flipped, uh, and um, our experience is that 
once about a third of your revenue, you start to change your infrastructure to be population health focused as opposed to fee for service focused. And I'll talk about what that is. That's probably one in five. Um, and then there's probably 5% left that are really tip of the spear, you know, trying to make themselves a captive system, for example, and bring everybody in through their health plan or um, trying, for example, to really get under managing pharmacy costs like we talked about last time. The reason I put this up there and the reason this matters is for those of you who um, are delivering better patient outcomes and reducing total cost of care, selling to a health plan makes a lot of sense. The health plan's risk is aligned. Selling to employer makes a lot of sense. The employer's risk is aligned. Those are the ultimate and risk-bearing entities. Selling to a health system is a more complex game. And you have to understand where they are on this kind of continuum. What a questions to ask, well, what percentage of your revenue for what types of patients is at value, right? How can I align with those types of patients, those segments that you're focusing on, those markets that you're focusing on, and where are you? Because coming in and just saying, well, everybody's moving to value, and so I'm gonna do things to help them reduce total cost of care. You probably got three quarters of the country where that is not the majority of what they're doing. Um, and it's not even the biggest portion of their business. Um, Sarah, you're asking a question of this. Yeah, is Kaiser an example of tip of the spear? Uh, I would say absolutely. Now it's funny to call a you know, nearly 80 year old organization tip of the spear, but there's a lot of other places that look to Kaiser as a model. Um, and you know, they are fully integrated, right? They are fully at risk. They're the ultimate in, in capitation. They'd actually be off the right-hand side of the chart there. Question um, from Prathamesh here. How are medical complications reimbursed in fee-for-service models? Aren't fee-for-service um, per diem hospitals incentived, incentivized to accept patients that are likely to have more complications? Um, it depends. It depends on the patient and it depends on the complexity of the procedure. Um, I would say in general, that's not actually the case. And there's two reasons for that. If you're just playing the traditional fee-for-service game, doing um, two relatively simple procedures almost always pays better than doing one complex procedure. Uh, and the reason for that has to do with just the kind of the reimbursement and how CPT coding works and the relative value units assigned to those. Um, hospitals also like to keep their quality statistics up. Uh, it helps with all sorts of reporting and marketing and relationships. So you don't wanna have necessarily bad mortality rates at your hospital. Now that's not always the case. And there are some complex uh, conditions and procedures uh, that can be quite lucrative, uh, but by and large, I'd rather be running a factory doing uncomplicated versions of high-end procedures all day long um, as opposed to managing the medical complications. Question here from Maureen. Uh, Maureen, what percentage of payments or volume live under risk share today, assuming kidney first, et cetera, fall under this? Depends on how you count risk. So if you count, um, you know, in some ways a DRG is, is risk, even though we put it under the fee for service. Right, you're getting paid a fixed amount for somebody's episode. Um, if you don't count those, if you really think about things like true upside and downside uh, and capitation, um, we're talking probably in the mid-teens percentages that are going through an arrangement like that by dollar, by dollar volume. Now, some markets are much more at risk. Here in California, uh, because of the influence of Kaiser and of co other commercial HMOs, and then the delegated model in Southern California, it's much higher than that. Um, in other places, they have almost no risk, um, but that's the trick. It's been a slow march uh, toward risk and it depends a lot on the pressures of the market. Toby, um, you say, do you have a list of tip of the spear companies like Kaiser? Not an official list, um, but I certainly happy to help you brainstorm ideas uh, if you're looking. Uh, so just send me an email and I'd be happy to chat about it. All right, Max Orozco, uh, do, do, does the economic relationship change in pediatrics? And I'm assuming you mean this kind of risk arrangement. Um, not in concept, but in size. Um, pediatrics is notoriously under reimbursed for a bunch of reasons. Uh, running a children's hospital is a very, very tough business. Um, and, um, but the, the structure is largely the same. 
I will say in peds, it's been even slower to move to value um, because there isn't the uh, influence of CMS uh, in the same way um, on Medicare. Now there is in Medicaid models uh, and you know we're approaching the point here in California, for example, where 50% of children are born on Medi-Cal. Um, so that's, that's the pressure. But as you think about pediatrics, if the adult game is relatively good commercial reimbursement, a lot of pressure to move to value from Medicare, um, the pediatrics is less good reimbursement kind of procedure for, for procedure um, and much of the value pressure coming from Medicaid, which is lower reimbursing, which varies state by state. All right, bunch of questions here and I'll take them kind of together. Um, Divya, what's the typical sales cycle of a place like Kaiser versus academic health centers versus other not-for-profits like Sutter? Um, and then I think I had a question actually from uh, Jared Morgan. What are some of the ways hospital systems currently are attempting to innovate? Is there any entrepreneurship happening? Um, and I take those because they're related questions. So the sales cycles of health systems historically have been quite slow. Um, I would say if you lined up the potential customers, employers tend to move the most quickly. It's why a lot of healthcare innovators start with employers. Health plans are probably somewhere in the middle. Um, healthcare providers tend to be the slowest. Um, it's because they're big multi-stakeholder organizations. As we've talked about, they have very strict IT security requirements and privacy requirements. Um, and then they're not necessarily centralized. They're very fragmented in how they, how they approach decision-making uh, in many cases. I'm not sure there's a big difference between kind of big integrated systems like Kaiser, community systems like Sutter, academic systems in terms of speed. Um, you know, it used to be that the kind of conventional women wisdom was that academics were the slowest, um, but many of them have kind of doubled down on innovation, right? We're, we're group here sponsored by an academic health center um, talking here today. Um, and so they've caught up, but I, you know, the typical sales cycle is till a two to three year kind of thing um, with a big system. If you really want to kind of scale deployment, system-wide deployment, um, now this does get to uh, the other question about is there innovation happening inside from Jared? And there's a lot of it. Um, nearly every system I know from Kaiser, which is you know obviously big integrated system, Sutter here in the organization that Chris Wall runs to places in the middle of the country like um, OSF, which has a $25 million innovation center uh, in Peoria. Um, right? Everybody is investing in this kind of innovation and a lot of entrepreneurship. And mostly those organizations have been charged with um, finding innovators uh, and helping them navigate the system. Um, some are more successful than others, but it's definitely a big emphasis and they're people worth knowing. Um, the other thing we are seeing is a, is a pretty good growth in hospitals, uh, particularly the big systems, becoming investors in strategics um, or strategic investors in small companies. Uh, so you see venture funds at places like Providence and Ascension and elsewhere. Um, that are that are even willing to take stakes, which is kind of another innovation approach. I think Anthony's got a question. Um, Sam, what are your thoughts on EHR integrated applications combining data-driven insights with automated workflow at the point of care uh, to transform clinical and financial results? Um, send me a note, Anthony, happy to connect you with others and talk more about your solution. All right. Samita, good question. How has FIRE and HL7 changed, if at all, the federally required openness of these uh, closed walled garden EHRs? Um, and um, slowly would be my answer. Um, you know, they have become open. Patient records are portable and more interoperable than they were before. Um, and the data exchange is, um, has gotten better as a result. But kind of full workflow integration um, is not necessarily, you know, FIRE and HL7 are not necessarily enough of a solution. And I think that's where people run into challenges. And I'm glad you found the CPT categories. All right. Yeah, so um, this is a great question, Megan Leslie. What is the best way to introduce a new product that would be saving providers money on the portion of their business that they are losing money? Medicaid slash Medicare. 
For example, a wound dressing that can close an amputation stage diabetic foot ulcer on elderly patients. So this is one of the great conundrums of working with health systems. Their economics are very much segmented by payer type. Um, so they get very different reimbursement from commercial versus Medicare versus Medicaid and even different payers within that. Um, health system org charts don't look that way. Health system org charts tend to be organized either regionally um, where it's a multi-regional system. Um, so it'd be a particular market um, by facility. Um, so somebody runs the hospital, somebody runs the medical center, or sometimes by service line, somebody's in charge of oncology or community care or whatever it might be. And so the trick is you have to find the place, the person who is disproportionately affected um, by those economics. So it may be if it's a regionally or facility organized kind of system, finding whoever runs the region or the facility uh, that has the highest percentage of Medicaid, uh, right? And talking to them, I guarantee you they're dealing with it. Um, it might be um, finding the service line leader um, that is most relevant for your solution from a clinical perspective. Um, or if you're a sort of back office op solution, it might be finding the right operational leader. But that's the trick. You kind of got to do some translation and think about whose challenge it's going to be. Uh, Keenan, um, can the efficiency in facilities management influence reimbursement rates? Um, it can influence profit for sure. I would say largely it doesn't influence the reimbursement rate. It influences how much they make because if they are, uh, if the utilization of a facility is high, obviously they're spreading out that fixed cost over um, more and more revenue. Uh, and so they're able to make a greater margin on every case and maybe have some more negotiating room. Um, the one exception to that I will say is to the extent that you're managing between inpatient and outpatient. So there are many things that can happen in a hospital or in a surgery center, or sometimes now even in a medical office, and they can be reimbursed quite differently. Now that's changing as you move to site neutral payments, um, but that kind of management, sort of site of care management um, can actually have a big revenue impact. Yeah, David Grossoff, given how very, very expensive a small number of patients are, as the smaller, are there smaller hospitals that have been plunged into financial distress um, by taking on DRG risk or some other supposedly controlled risk taking? Uh, and do you think maybe they need to buy insurance? Um, we haven't seen as much of this lately. We did see this in the early 90s uh, as, H, as we saw dramatic growth in HMOs. We saw providers taking on risk that they could not manage well, uh, and it did fundamentally affect their economics. Um, we haven't seen it yet. I think the bigger impact um, because of the slow growth of value has been that this, um, this cross subsidy between segments, demographic impact, particularly if volume goes out the door. Um, you know, our uh, different estimates are out there, um, but if you look at the rating agencies, you know, they're, they're estimating um, that probably something like 10 or 12% of hospitals in the country um, are within a year of a major financial crisis. Um, and then if you take ones that are just um, financially insecure, it gets you up to about 20%, right? So there's some real challenges out there, but that's mostly driven by volume drop off and, and uh, payer mix challenges more than it's driven by the shift of value. And unlike what we saw with some of the HMOs. Um, do you, Divya, do you have a sense of the average per diem cost for an ICU bed in the United States? Um, wouldn't you incentivize a longer length of stay if you are making uh, per diem costs on a patient? Um, the answer to the second question is yes. Uh, that's one of the challenges of fee-for-service medicine. Uh, and it's why commercial payers who do have per diems uh, will require prior authorization for the length of stay so that they have to sign off on somebody staying additional nights. Um, and that's a big part of the, the kind of dance that providers and payers have. Uh, in terms of the average cost, it varies widely, uh, but if you want to send me a note, I can, I can help you find it if there's a market that you're particularly interested in. Um, Herb, how do hospitals think about running complex care clinics? 
uh, tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, uh, others. Is there any incentive to provide coordinated care to complex and chronic patient populations? Um, I will say, uh, my experience is they are not at the top of the list when it comes to shifting to population health, um, just simply because of the small numbers in there. That said, um, there are um, systems that get hit by a disproportionate number of these. Um, and I think they're very interested in kind of carve out solutions to help them because they're not well equipped to do it. Um, but it's not where most of the value-based arrangements start necessarily. All right, a little more info, keep the questions coming. Um, but just, just to round out, why is value hard? And we talk about those who've kind of read PHM as the epicenter. This is why, right? This is a stylized version of how you think about the operating model. But you know, the traditional volume-driven model is bring people in and then um, get them in and, and do as much as you can, right? But it's a, it's a pyramid model. You bring people in across the specialties. Value-driven care requires a very different operating model inside. Uh, it requires focusing on condition management and think about episodic care. It requires putting pop health at the center. It requires significant investments in primary care. And it requires thinking very differently about efficiency. It's not just about reducing the length of a visit and getting people in when they need to get in. Um, it may be about actually providing much more intensive uh, home-based care or primary care for those populations that are gonna benefit from it. So we've talked so far um, mostly about the hospital side of providers, um, but we are um, in a country where um, systems largely are integrated health systems. Uh, they have brought in physician enterprises. There's been a lot of physician acquisitions over the past 20 or 30 years. And that's how we've created these health systems. And the goal of these health systems fundamentally um, is to provide integrated care, but it's also to provide the right referral um, streams for the hospitals themselves and for the specialties themselves. I need a primary care doctor to keep my specialist busy. I need specialists to keep my hospital busy um, and to keep my imaging busy and to keep my labs busy. Um, and if I can align those physicians, put them on my EHR, put them on my payroll in some states where that's allowed, uh, I can start to control some of those referrals or at least direct them in the right way. So what we see is a whole range of options. And I will um, start this by saying, um, physician licensing and physician laws are very much state-based. Which of these you're allowed to have and what their structure is varies by state. So for example, here in California, uh, there's a corporate practice of medicine law uh, where physicians cannot be directly employed by a non-physician entity with a few exceptions. Um, and so uh, they will form medical groups. Those medical groups will have contracts with systems. They might license the brand and everything else from the system, uh, but they are independently governed as a professional organization. There are other states uh, where you can just be on the payroll of the hospital. Uh, and so you end up with different arrangements based on the physician structure, but also based on uh, the laws and regulations in the state in which the place operates. So there's a whole range. You can start with just having an independent practice association, sort of an a tight industry group of physicians. They will then contract with health plans together uh, and often will get closer to one system in town than another, sometimes even co-brand with it. I can have a med staff model where I credential people on my medical staff. Um, I can then start to move into what looks more like medical group kind of models, either physician hospital organizations or co-management. And then at the bottom here, I can actually start to share risk with my physicians. So not only are they delivering care only for my patients, um, but I'm probably sharing risk with them uh, in terms of both upside and downside. It matters understanding what the physician alignment model is and where the system you're dealing with is headed. And the reason that it matters is um, so often it's easy to think, well, I've got a contract with the system. They'll just have the physicians use my solution. And in many cases, those physicians are independently governed or at best co-governed. They might have their own practices. They might even work with multiple systems uh, and they're professionals and they'll practice the way they want. And so understanding the physician change management aspect and how do you help the system bring physicians on board, get them not just to have the solution, but to utilize the solution can be quite important, including incentive alignment. Um, because all of the things I just talked about for reimbursement for hospitals apply to physicians as well. 
when we talk about a surgery, there's the facility and there's the surgeon. Uh, and you can't be seen as doing something that's taking away their volume. And just kind of a good view of uh, what the physician landscape looks like in the US. Numbers are a few years old, uh, but they were the latest we had. Uh, shape is the same. We're talking about about a million physicians in the US, uh, slightly more specialists than there are primary care. Um, and we're now at the point where it's about 50-50 overall, uh, those physicians that are employed by a big system versus owning their own businesses and some sort of structure. Um, it does tend to vary um, by, um, by specialty. Um, as a general rule, the more lucrative the specialty, the more physicians want to hang on to ownership, which is why you see the surgical subspecialties at the top, uh, the more that it is uh, either there's value from a hospital covering the overhead costs or not necessarily as valuable to do more volume, uh, like peds and psychiatry and anesthesia and EM at the bottom, you tend to have more uh, physician employment by systems. Yeah, Eric Dye, what impact do you envision concierge healthcare offerings, e.g. one medical, having on existing players? They, see prim they seem primarily focused on primary care with more complex procedures referred to existing health systems. Are they peeling off a few percentage of the commercial patients? It's a great question, Eric. Um, you know, primary care is complex for health systems. For um, the vast majority of health systems, um, primary care is a loss leader. Um, the, the reimbursement from primary care does not necessarily cover the costs, but they invest in primary care because that's the front door to their system. When somebody is attributed to a primary care physician, they'll, can, they'll bring more of their share of care to the system. That primary care physician will be sending to the system's labs, to their imaging, to their specialties. Uh, and ultimately when somebody needs hospital care, they'll be getting it at that system's hospital. So um, it depends on the position of the system um, that you're looking at and the position of a concierge player. So if you have a concierge player that is referring still mostly to the dominant system in the market um, when they need to, that can actually be a real boon to the system. It creates primary care capacity, also might be bearing the loss, uh, and the system really doesn't lose its valuable volume. And in fact, you've seen players, including One Medical, um, sign partnerships with health systems uh, in order to help them with just that. They'll create a great, more efficient front-end experience that the consumer loves. The system will do what it does and everything's in good shape. Now, the flip side of this is we are seeing um, payers, for example, invest in primary care specifically for the reason of having greater control over the referral patterns and keeping people out of that higher cost care at higher cost systems. That is a big threat to these economics. Uh, because it picks off those bits uh, that represent a significant amount of the profit for the systems. So I think we'll start to see more of that over time, um, but it really depends on the structure in the market and the type of concierge solution you're looking at. Um, even among those independents, uh, it's just an interesting uh, chart. Um, physicians are getting together, groups are rolling up. Um, you know, the percentage of groups with 50 plus physicians uh, continues to increase, we're seeing a, a roll up and a consolidation of a fragmented industry. So what is ambulatory care? Well, what makes you good at running a hospital does not make you good at running a physician group. And that's one of the challenges. Um, this is kind of our Oliver Wyman checklist of what makes a high performing physician enterprise. Um, but it's do you run the thing well? Do you do scheduling and workflow and expense management and all of that space utilization well? The kind of retail parts of the business. Um, I've run into practices where um, they have 30% of their appointment slots open on a given day because of no-shows, because of last minute cancellations, because every physician wants a different lunch break and vacation schedule and visit link. And I've been in ones that have 5% open. That efficiently, efficiency drops directly to the bottom line and it's kind of a retail operations oriented thinking about how you create an efficient practice. Do I have the right strategy? Am I going to the right markets, the right locations, the right geographies? Am I referring to the right places? Again, it's a retail business. Where am I dropping down this location? Patient access. Is it easy for people to get in? Can they get an appointment? Can they walk in? Do I run a call center that helps people find 
uh, find appointments across my system. RevCycle, am I charging well, coding well, documenting well, collecting well, appealing well? How do I think about my financial performance? Am I negotiating well with the payers? Um, am I paying my physicians in the right way? And that gets me to physician alignment. How do I think about keeping physicians, at least uh, the most productive ones, engaged and motivated uh, without all the revenue necessarily going out the back door? This is really different than that map of running a hospital. And it's why when you get inside a health system, they have to get good at both. And many are good at both, but it can be a real challenge. For reference, um, this is a sense of kind of the metrics that physician enterprises look at. And if you're thinking about selling something to physicians, um, ask yourself, well, which metrics do I support the performance of? First, which category? Right? Finance and ops, market impact, quality, customer and staff experience. And then within that, which ones of these am I targeting? Helps to think through the story. So first, what kind of population am I gonna help you perform in? How do I think about it? Second, well, which metrics am I hitting? How do I help you perform? How do I help you with your own business objectives? All right, so everything I just talked about was a pretty traditional health system, but we all know that uh, care is moving to new places. It's moving into the home, it's moving onto screens and into pockets and purses. Um, and this is both an opportunity and a threat for the system. One thing on the left-hand side of the spectrum that we know is happening is shift within the physical system to lower acuity care settings. Uh, we see that a lot from clinics to retail, from outpatient to clinics, et cetera. We're seeing a dramatic growth in kind of retail health centers. And I don't just necessarily mean inside a Walgreens or a CVS or a Rite Aid or a Walmart, but urgent cares, walk-in cares, uh, new kinds of players like one medical, convenient small locations that are becoming that new front door, often unaffiliated with the system. Care that comes to people. You know, Landmark, which was famous for its home-based care, just sold to Optum. Um, and there's a lot of players like this, where what we're finding is that instead of saying, well, the solution is transportation or the solution is telehealth, the solution may be going to somebody's home and particularly at risk for those high cost populations that can be a real opportunity. And then a lot of patient self-management. On top of this is um, the fundamental consumer appeal of telehealth. Um, and the last year has been a real boom year for telehealth. Uh, we at Oliver Wyman run a survey every year uh, of consumer habits. And what we found for years and years and years was that about 70% of insured people um, had access to a telehealth solution, a virtual visit solution. And that was through the government, through their payer, through their employer, through their provider system, um, whomever. But fewer than 10% before COVID had ever tried it. And when we asked them why they hadn't tried it, it was always four things that came up, always at the top of the list. One was, didn't know I had the benefit or didn't know how to, to get at it. Two was, didn't, real, didn't know how to land, download the app or didn't know how to access it. Three was experience. And the experience piece uh, was a really interesting one. The time people go and try and use something like telehealth for the first time is when it's two in the morning and they got 103 degree fever and they're finally fed up and they roll out of bed and they go, okay, maybe rather than going to urgent care or the ER, I'll try this telehealth thing. And in that moment, in that kind of acute moment, many telehealth solutions ask them to enter a patient history with their thumbs and go find their payer login, right? And it's an experience that takes 15 or 20 minutes to get going. And the friction to doing that just leads people to go in elsewhere. So we, we've seen that get fixed over time. And the last is not knowing what it costs. And we saw that. And we saw a lot of that all the way up through 2019. 2020, all of that changed. And all of that changed for a number of reasons. Um, some of them regulatory. So more services, and you can see them on the left-hand side, more services could be offered via telehealth. Licensure requirements came down, at least temporarily. Restrictions on remote monitoring came down. Reimbursement improved. Money was put into it um, through the CARES Act. Um, and it, we, between that 
and the um, and the demand for virtual care just as a result of the health concerns of the pandemic. We saw many places where 70 or 80% of their care was being delivered virtually at the peak of the pandemic. Now, that's not lasting. Um, what it's settled down to is kind of in the 20 to 30% range. Most systems I talk to, depending on how ambitious and innovative they are, uh, expect uh, to be in the kind of 20 to 50% range, steady state. But what we learned is that when people try telehealth, they tend to like it. And we've seen this in the data for years. And so on an ongoing basis, we've now got an experiment where we've had tens, you know, hundreds of millions of people try telehealth and we'll see if it sticks, if it remains a habit. And we know that it's a better experience um, at a minimum for the kind of transactional visit. I would challenge you, and, and consumer empathy is an important thing here. Think about the fastest you could get an in-person physician visit. If I were doing it, I would pick up the phone, I'd call my physician, I'd see if I could get in. I'd then have to put my shoes on. You'd gather the kids up, you get in the car, you drive to where you're going, you park, you go in, you go up the elevator, you check in, maybe they'll let you in right away, you have your visit, you do that all in reverse. And it is really hard to do that in less than 90 minutes. And if you can instead do something on your screen in even 10 or 15 minutes, that has huge appeal, particularly for those with mobility challenges, seniors, or for those who put a high value on their time, um, maybe because uh, they uh, have childcare requirements or work requirements, or they're working two jobs, or they work odd hours. So we are going to see there is a fundamental consumer convenience around that. Um, there's also an opportunity to make care more continuous rather than episodic. Hey, don't call us, we'll call you. So the telehealth piece is really interesting to watch over the next several years. Divya, do smart homes and remote patient monitoring systems have the same legal and malpractice risks as traditional healthcare, e.g. hospitals and physician groups? Um, in sh Yes and no, I would say. The yes, legally, at, at the, on the other end of those smart homes and remote patient monitoring systems needs to be a clinician. And it's a clinician who bears risk when they offer medical advice or they don't look after somebody the way they should. The other side of that is the risk of um, mistakes, medical mistakes and the safety issues um, in the home are much lower than in a hospital. Hospital is a very dangerous place to be if you're a mostly healthy person. The risk of everything from infections to somebody giving you the wrong medication to doing the wrong procedure, and the home reduces a lot of those risks. So yes, legally, you have the same risk and there's a provider on the other end. Um, practically, many of those safety risks start to go away. Maureen, with a chronic disease focus in a younger non-Medicare population, e.g. around obesity, that generates huge payer costs and touches multiple providers with comorbidities before potential for expensive, e.g. inpatient bariatric surgeries and long-term follow-up. Who where on the healthcare side sees value in managing a younger chronic care population? Uh, IDNs with a high percentage of value managed patients? Um, I, I would start in three places. Um, employers, for sure. Um, and employers um, are very interested in these solutions. The dollars can be low, but there's a huge number of potential customers out there. And as I mentioned, you can get them to move relatively quickly compared to others. Um, definitely payers with significant commercial books uh, of business, as you suggest. And then IDNs with high percentages of value managed patients, I would say yes, with one addition, high percentage of commercial value managed populations. You see IDNs that have a lot of value managed patients, uh, but most of that is the Medicare or Medicaid population, and that's not necessarily gonna be the same. Um, and so you have to look for those in commercial, but I'd, employers and payers should have a lot of interest in that. All right. So what's coming next in terms of telehealth? Um, well, to the question, uh, to Divya's question, I think we're gonna see a lot more use of remote patient monitoring. Um, Physicians say that it improves their workflow or workload. It increases their panel size. They're able to manage more, certainly improves health outcomes. 
We've seen some good examples from Nebraska Medicine there. Um, more and more virtual medical visits. Uh, this is one of my favorite stats. 95% uh, of the time in a virtual visit is actually spent with the provider. It's only about 20% for an in-person visit uh, with all of those steps that I laid out. It's more cost efficient. Um, now, reimbursement parity is gonna be an interesting thing. It costs less to deliver a virtual visit. Many traditional providers are getting the same reimbursement, particularly in states like California from commercial payers, uh, as they do for an in-person. That does not bring cost out of the system. So the hope is that over time, actually taking cost out will bring prices down. And so then cost will come out of the system, uh, but we gotta see how that sorts out. And Hoyman, actually, you just asked the question I got to, you're a good setup guy here. Um, do you see the physician professional reimbursement for telehealth staying at current levels? What do you see as the factors that would influence this? If not, do you see it reverting back to the modest pre-COVID levels? It, it can't stay at the same levels as physical care forever. Um, those rates are too high and reflect a certain cost structure. I don't think it'll go all the way back to the modest pre-COVID levels. I think we'll end up with something in between. Um, but um, we'll end up with something in between. But that'll be the that'll be a great negotiation between payers and providers. Um, we're now as of January of this year, six states that have some sort of reimbursement parity requirement for commercial payers, including big places like California and Florida. Uh, so provider systems are certainly gonna keep pushing for that. Yeah, Divya, it's interesting. You say for the physician, the cost is the same in terms of their time when you compare in-person and virtual visits. That's not actually true for telehealth. Telehealth is much more efficient. So for a physician to spend seven to 10 minutes with a patient um, in a traditional office, um, you can only do, even if you're really efficient, probably three or maybe four of those an hour um, because of the downtime in between. And many places it's actually more like two or two and a half an hour um, because of the time waiting for patients, doing room prep, moving between rooms um, and getting caught in the hallway, um, the no-show rate, all of those things happening. If you're a physician doing telehealth, you can actually move at a much faster clip. Uh, and there's a lot less downtime between visits and all your slots are full. So true, the amount of time in front of the patient may be the same, um, but it's a much more efficient environment. Um, and the other you say it'll be hard to recruit virtual MDs if you don't pay them the same as in-person visits. I think it's hard if you don't pay them the same in total. I'm not sure you have to pay them the same per visit, given what I just talked about, because it's a more productive environment. Uh, right, on an annual basis is different than on a per visit basis. Herb, if telehealth is more efficient for doctors, i.e. can treat more patients, will there be a glut of doctors in the near future? Um, I would argue that we actually have a glut of some types of doctors now and probably will in the future. Um, there's a lot of talk about a primary care shortage in the US, I agree we have a primary care shortage in the US. We do not have a primary care physician shortage in the US. We actually have one primary care physician for about every 1400 people in the country. And if you talk to those who manage primary care practices, a 1400 patient panel is a perfectly reasonable panel. They often aim for something more like 2000 or 2200. The challenge is, is that primary care is inequitably distributed um, and those physicians are inequitably distributed. They're practicing in inefficient ways, often with the wrong incentives. They're not given the kind of teams around them that they need, um, because as I said, they're a loss leader for the system, unless the system's in value. They don't engage with patients with the kinds of digital tools they need. And then when we think about what primary care really means, it doesn't always mean a doctor. It may be a pharmacist providing advice on a medication um, or doing a medication reconciliation. It may be a nurse helping somebody think about their condition. It may be a coach and maybe somebody in your home or on a screen or in an office. And so I do think we are um, going to see an evolution of the health profession um, that says, how do we make sure everybody has access to primary care? This idea of a physician kind of going from being on the front lines to being more of the conductor of the orchestra, um, right? With a team-based care approach and a lot more virtual tools is gonna matter. And then we got to solve a lot of the equity issues. And telehealth can help with that if we can bridge some of the digital divide. 
Um, but that's also a big piece of it. Yeah, Laura McIntosh. Relationships are very important. What effect will telehealth have on rural locations where relationships are important and communities struggle to keep a hospital operating, operating within a reasonable geographic area? Um, it, the rural health the rural health situation is a tough one, and I'm not going to do it all justice here. I've spent a good amount of time on it. It varies a lot community to community. Um, so I have worked with systems that have had to go into rural communities and shut down hospitals. It is a painful, painful thing. Uh, but there are good ways to do that and bad ways to do that. Good ways to do that involve involving the community, providing transportation, providing the kind of urgent care services one needs, et cetera. Um, same thing with telehealth. I've done focus groups in rural communities where they say, if I had the choice between a two day a week traveling specialist or a telehealth kiosk with five day a week appointments, I'd take telehealth. I've been in other communities where they say exactly the opposite. Um, the trick is it's a community by community solution. Um, and I am afraid, unfortunately, that uh, with the recession and COVID, you know, rural hospitals were hit among the hardest. Um, and they might not have the luxury of being able to have that conversation in the right way. So it's 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 a challenge and it's gonna to continue to be a challenge. And there's a real need for solutions for rural health where you don't have the kind of density you need to support uh, the services that, that people deserve. Yeah. Richard, note, we're short about 9,500 geriatricians today. It's only gonna get worse many more retire than add to the specialty. Yes, geriatricians are going down. Uh, senior care is a big deal. I was counting them as part of primary care overall. Uh, but if you focus on geriatricians, it's a, it's a small number. Yeah, Divya, um, how do you see limitations in broadband, e.g. rural areas, and digital literacy, e.g. older populations, affecting the adoption of telehealth? Um, the former more than the latter. Um, the limitations in broadband are real. Um, the digital divide is becoming a social determinant of health and we have to address it if we're gonna get telehealth out there. Digital literacy absolutely matters and we do have people who lack digital literacy. Um, that said, um, I think there's a lot of stereotyping that goes on, particularly about senior populations. Um, one example that resonates in my head is Sean Morris who runs Privia Health tells me that more than 30% of uh, the people he has who are his patients over 90 years old are regular users of his patient portal. Um, we see, we have through this pandemic taught many grandparents to use FaceTime, right? And I would say um, where we have digital literacy issues first, be careful about how you stereotype those segments. And then secondly, um, think a lot about, um, think a lot about um, how you're making a solution that's as easy to use as possible. All right. Andrew, how do you view AI health tools that affect patient outcomes, non-physician AI impacting the current health systems? I I'm bullish on AI. I think there's a big opportunity for AI. Um, the, um, there's, there's different categories of AI. I think there's a big opportunity to improve efficiency. You do stuff like rev cycle and operations management and all of that um, and take a lot of cost out, which lets you refocus people um, back on patient care and serving consumers. I know that's not the part you're talking about. Um, I think consumer faces ones, you think about things like Ada and Babylon and um, even some of the stuff 98.6 is doing or Ginger's doing or others are doing with AI to provide patient care. It can make physicians a lot more efficient uh, and it can help people feel more empowered about their own health, right? They'd, um, having people get smart advice in terms of checking their symptoms or knowing what to do next or knowing where to go, or in the case of mental health, um, actually even building a therapeutic alliance with AI, right? That's, that's a real thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of improve the efficiency of what we do and improve the experience through AI. Catherine Winkler. How will these systems deal with the reality of an aging population doubling in size in 20 years, made of either relatively healthy seniors no longer employed or frail elderly with multimorbidities? Do you see systems ultimately entering the patchwork quilt of care homes and clinics 
as well as in-home care owning retirement to grave? How will elder care be supported if new models not figured out? I don't think it will be. I think we need, um, I think we need new models. We cannot build enough real estate in this country fast enough um, to, and it's way too expensive uh, to accommodate the, the age wave that we have coming. Um, traditional health systems don't have the capacity or the, or the economics, frankly, because they're not paid very well um, for people who are frail elderly and multimorbidities. Um, we need to find ways to keep people in their homes. We need to use technology and logistics to do that. Um, you know, our old capital intensive labor intensive models just, just won't survive demographics. I think it's a huge area for innovation. Um, Meiji Tang, what's the best way to sell COVID testing products to hospitals and doctor's offices? Um, have a better product, <laughs> it's the short answer. Um, that's a complex kind of reimbursement landscape and a, uh, a complex supply chain. I'm happy to have an email exchange if you want. There's a lot of effort going at that right now and a lot of effort going at that space. Ravi, um, how are health systems thinking about extended care teams at home and in the community, especially when the burden shifts to families and friends, particularly long-term care? Uh, I'll split up your question. Um, a lot of focus lately on caregiver. I think the caregiver is underserved. We have a growing so-called sandwich generation that's taking care of both parents and children, um, and actually a healthcare system that's not designed to support them very well. Um, and those who are caregivers really feel the burden. There's a number of caregiver solutions out there. The challenge with caregiver solutions is they're not um, mostly reimbursed today. Um, so you have to do them uh, either just because they're the right thing to do or they help keep the ultimate patient out of the hospital and you're in a value-based arrangement to do that. Um, but that's changing. Every time I see consumer work, it shows that those who are caregivers would pay cash for solutions that help them engage better. Um, and so I think there's, you'll see a growing space. In terms of long-term care, um, when you think about home or um, facilities, think about what I said to, to Catherine. I think there's a huge need for innovation there um, and we, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, on the, Dave, on the subject of sales approval integration challenges for new solution vendors, uh, do we foresee commercial IT solution marketplaces? where vendors like some of us will get vetted thoroughly once and approved for deployment in any clinical context. There's certainly some effort to do this um, by the big platforms. You know, Epic has its app orchard, for example. Um, and then even uh, those that are trying to get into healthcare like Salesforce, um, which is um, make big pushes with CRM and healthcare. Uh, we'll have approved partners and apps. Um, man, I, I have a hard time seeing health system CIOs letting go of that final approval authority, um, but it might grease the skids a little bit. Eric Dye, um, what role do you see for community health workers for supporting Medicaid patients? And have you seen any interest from payers or health systems to cover these non-traditional healthcare workers? Lots of interest. Um, there's a lot of talk about how do you use community health workers, those who may have training other than clinical training um, the big challenge is licensing and what they're allowed to do and the liability associated with that. And that really rests at the state level uh, and a lot of state medical associations that resist um, those uh, with lesser credentials or no credentials uh, engaging in direct patient care. That, that I think is gonna be the big barrier we have to overcome. Let's see. Um, Jared Morgan. Regarding an early cancer detection device in the middle of development, um, your talk indicates I should prioritize selling to payers as this reduces the overall total cost of care. However, it is a non-invasive urinalysis test and we had considered direct to consumer via mail. Is there a business model that includes taking advantage of both channels or would you recommend only focusing on the former first at least? Um, I, I don't take away that, you know, for a device, you should prioritize selling to payers only. And I'd, I'd be interested if you want to send me a note to learn more about your device. Um, if it makes for a, there may be both a value story and a fee for service story around this. Consumers want cancer detected earlier. 
if I am able to go for my screening at the cancer center that uses your device um, and detects cancer earlier, that is going to, for a fee-for-service system, that's a differentiator to bring people into their cancer center, to bring them into their oncology service line. And so that might actually be an angle worth going after as well. Right? It does reduce total cost of care for those who have cancer, but it also brings people in for when you do catch cancer, uh, you make sure they're going to the system. Um, and that, that can matter. I think direct-to-consumer is growing. Very price sensitive is the thing to watch out and a big marketing expense. Uh, so you've really got to have some skill set around digital marketing in particular. Um, but it's it's a growing space and I'm pretty bullish on it. Um, and then the payer game with something like a device or a test is not so much about getting payers to buy it directly, but it's about getting them to cover it. Uh, so it becomes a coverage conversation with payers. I think probably more of a oncology differentiator would be my guess for providers. And then you know, it's some direct to consumer business if you can get the price of the marketing right. But um, that's my guessing based on uh, a couple of sentences. So happy to happy to chat more. All right, so just, just to kind of round out the slides and round out the telehealth conversation, you know, what do we expect to see over the next few years? What is everybody who wants to be in the virtual care, the, the care delivery business here need to be thinking about? Convenience and timeliness of access, that's why 90 minutes versus 10 minutes, big driver of value. How do you compete with that? We now actually have physicians who say they are more comfortable than before with virtual care. Many patients and families prefer it got consumer demand and physician demand. Um, the kind of new front door to the point about urban care, urban and rural areas, if we can get connectivity right in rural areas, we can actually improve access. Telehealth has to go from the video visit to being more continuous and more data-based and wearables and virtual tech are gonna make that happen. Um, telehealth is also st just starting to move into the value-based care business and to be in network. You see places like uh, Amwell and Teladoc launching virtual primary care. They don't just want to be a replacement for urgent care or a replacement for retail care, but they want to be contracted with the health plan and actually taking care of a population. And so you start to see this kind of new digital health system of the future forming. Um, we will see preventative care through telehealth, which keeps people from coming in when they don't need to. Um, you know, the medical societies have come kind of reluctantly into virtual care. They'll continue to evolve. We'll see it. We got to keep the pressure on. Um, there's a huge opportunity on number eight around virtual care for behavioral health. You know, the traditional model of behavioral health um, is not necessarily um, warm and welcoming. It's not the kind of thing that's relatable in many cases. Um, and virtual care can meet people where they are when they're most vulnerable and most comfortable at hours that matter to them. Uh, and be a better solution. Second opinions, um, we saw the, the grand rounds and Doctor on Demand coming together. We'll continue to see some kind of push there. Um, to the point about caregiver, telehealth is great for caregivers. Um, telehealth lets some, a caregiver, for example, join a visit remotely with their parent without having to come across the country or come across town. Uh, and I think we'll see more there. Certainly in post-acute, you don't have to bring people in. Uh, and then, you know, depending on how long we stay masked up and at home, um, people are continuing to look for virtual solutions, whether it's online or uh, online shopping or telehealth. And we're going to see continued pushes there. But it's a it's an exciting market right now and a good opportunity. So that's it for me and for the slides. Uh, I got plenty of time for more questions if you've got them. Uh, or if not, like I said, you're welcome to send emails. Maureen, for the increase in use of RPM um, and telehealth, do you think they have the opportunity to help increase or have you seen increases in achievement to facility and provider quality slash paper performance measures, e.g. measurement of blood pressure or BMI with RPM? Um, yes, in limited cases. So inside of um, many of the chronic care kind of next generation models, whether it was the early ones like Care More or the newer ones now like Alignment or Oak Street or whomever, or even Landmark that goes in the home. When you talk to those providers, much of what they do is virtual. Now it may be phone or it may be text or it may be um, whatever, um, but um, that inside of those is quite a bit and it does drive better 
um, performance. You do get better blood pressure, or as you say, BP or BMI with RPM. Um, but it's got to be paired with the right connection. It's not just remote monitoring. It's remote monitoring plus uh, the connection with the provider plus the insights. Um, and that's the piece. I don't think most traditional systems has figured this out. You know, places like Kaiser have, but most of them haven't integrated it into their core care models yet. Laura, uh, the VA has been forward in remote care. What are they doing with telehealth quite a bit? Uh, and how would you get in contact with their innovation group? We actually had somebody on the last session who is working with their innovation group. So if you want to send me a note, I'd be happy to connect you. I mean, um, when focusing on providing value to employers, how do they prioritize employee health? What is the best revenue structure when working with them? Also, is there a way to get revenue from referrals by sending these employees to a certain health system or physician? Um, it, you know, employers tend to prefer relatively straightforward pricing. Um, you've got to think about is my solution something that's really about employee engagement, right? It's kind of a benefit. Or is it about bringing down the cost of care? Those will be different buyers and different uh, solutions inside of the employer. Um, the, you are not gonna get revenue from referrals from the health system. Uh, paying for referrals is mostly verboten uh, in the US, um, but you may be able to demonstrate your value to an employer or to a health plan by making sure that high value referrals are being made. So it's a matter of kind of who's paying you for it. Um, but there certainly are solutions there. It's why we've seen uh, some of the centers of excellence grow and others. Teresa, um, with the rise of telehealth and virtual visits, um, will you discuss ways we can assist seniors with little social support from family members, um, i.e. 84 years old living alone and not technically savvy? Um, I am not sure I've seen anybody who's actually cracked that uh, in a material way yet. There's certainly plenty of um, attempts going on um, and a lot of recognition that social isolation and loneliness are major comorbidities and drivers of poor health uh, and that we have a socially isolated and lonely, lonely population uh, that is not necessarily technically savvy. Um, to date, most of those have been the traditional community, um, community social services that I've seen. Um, so as, as Christine mentioned, I'm involved in um, Meals on Wheels here in San Francisco. That's exactly the population Meals on Wheels is checking on uh, and helping them connect and providing a lot more support than food. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for innovation and it's much needed there. Um, let's see, Laura, how are data considered as a value proposition for innovation? For example, offering social determinants of health or behavioral or home data that is not otherwise available to an EHR. Data alone is a hard sell. Um, what you hear from systems mostly is that they're overwhelmed with data. There are too many pages and too many screens and too many points in the EHR. What they're really looking for are actionable insights. Um, so social determinants or behavioral or home data plus triggers, plus alerts, plus insights is what they're really looking for. It's hard to sell the data. Now you may be able to sell the data to other enablement players who do that if you've got a good solution. Um, but mostly what you hear from systems is they've got too much data and not enough insights coming out of it. Um, Maureen, how does patient satisfaction affect payment to facilities or providers or other? Um, so there is, patient satisfaction does affect um, payments to facilities. So when you look at their, um, their scores, um, things like CAP scores, those are driven in part by patient satisfaction. And Medicare will, will rate hospitals and pay hospitals based on those numbers. You'll see it in the scores. Now, it's a very specific survey. It tends to be encounter-weighted. So the more people, the more somebody comes in, the more they get the survey. Um, but patient satisfaction does matter, and there's a whole suite of kind of patient satisfaction monitoring solutions linked to those payments. Um, I mean, when working with health systems and pricing our product from a cost savings perspective, what is the expected ROI the system is typically looking for? 
ROI is probably all over the map. The bigger the bigger challenge they see is attribution. Um, systems that that are focused on innovation and investing in innovations will have six or eight different programs going on to address the same problem, whether it's readmissions or a particular clinical measurement or quality or sepsis or you know you name it. Um, and so what I would say is coming in and saying, here's how you can attribute attribute ROI to what we did and only to what we did is what's gonna help you stand a, stand apart from the crowd. That's that's the hard part of it. Um, Thanos, would a patient self-care solution with evidence from other European countries require further US-based evidence? Um, depends, if you're talking about regulatory approval, uh, that's a different story if you're just talking about marketing data because it's a non-clinical solution. Um, yeah, I've seen solutions with with European data uh, be successful. Ultimately, you wanna get some US data on top of that, but I've seen it happen. Divya, how do you connect clinical trials or obtain the data from healthcare systems in order to provide intelligence and actionable insight or validate tests, diagnostics, platforms, and or devices? Um, the best way to do it is get it written into your early contracts, even if you have to take a pricing, um, even if you have to take a pricing discount to do it. Um, the first couple of reference accounts can go a long way, but you've got to be smart about saying what data you want and designing that trial from the outset. Um, that's the way I've seen it work the best. If you come on the back end and say, oh, now give me all your data, uh, you're going to run into all sorts of trouble with health systems. Monica. How do physicians make decisions to adopt new technologies, e.g. publications in medical journals, colleague recommendations, requests from patients, and reimbursement level? I would say yes, 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 and yes. All of those things uh, influence physician decision-making, and increasingly as they affiliate with systems, like uh, nearly 50% are now. Also, there's some enterprise buying decisions that are being made uh, in ways they weren't um, just 10 years ago. Uh, Natalie, are thresholds determined and readjusted with AI from RPM data regulated, e.g. FDA approval needed? Um, I don't know, and I would need a lot more specifics to find somebody who does know, um, but if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to help you navigate that. Oh, Maureen gives me a compliment, which is always welcome. Keep them coming. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on moving health home and Amazon care? You know, the Amazon Care in particular announcement this um, week got a lot of attention. And uh, is any one player going to be successful or not? We'll see. But I think what it's indicative of is that the growth in virtual care and the growth in home care is here to stay. And that we have a lot of players with a lot of capital who are going to throw it at this space because of how valuable it can be uh, and because of how kind of broken the rest of the system is. So, in 10 years, you know, will we all be getting our care from Amazon or Walmart or a place we've never heard of? I don't know, but I would venture to predict uh, that most of us will not be getting that kind of primary care from a traditional community health system and that those not-for-profit community health systems uh, will be maybe in partnership with those solutions, maybe playing a very different role, um, but that somebody's going to deliver uh, a very valuable, uh, a sort of a more valuable, um, more efficient solution. Oh, you guys are sweet. I was making a joke about compliments. Now you're all giving me compliments. <laughs> Thank you, Divya uh, David. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, how do you align incentives between payers and providers for sharing data for mutual benefit, such as COPD readmissions? Um, payers have been working on this for a long time. It tends to vary regionally. So there's actually pretty good data sharing in California and, and infrastructure and organizations for that. In other markets, it's just getting stood up. Um, but it tends to vary market by market, and I guarantee you there's somebody inside of any payer you're talking to who's working on that. Yeah, Laura, you ask, is there an industry group like Healthbox that you recommend entrepreneurs contact for the possibility of pilots? There's a lot of them out there, and some more incubator-oriented, some more pilot-oriented. Depends on who you're going after. There are groups that are better targeted to employers, some that are the health systems coming together, um, some that are payers, um, some that are pharma, actually. 
Um, so if you if you send me a little more about what you're working on, I'm happy to to think of the one that might be the best fit for you. All right. Okay. Thank. That's us. Uh, that's all. We do. You did answer close to 60 again. It's good. You guys ask good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. And uh, I hope you found Sam's talks really valuable. I do. Uh, it's very insightful. And uh, we'll have to bring Sam back again. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye.